So I've spent my entire career uh, working on software systems that have incorporated streaming telemetry in, in one form or another, um, and mainly in the, in the applications for the industrial world. Uh, I spent many years working on a time series database product uh, for storing historical telemetry for, for analysis. Um, I've worked on pub sub systems for sharing telemetry among different applications. And I've worked on uh, data collection agents for uh, control systems, industrial equipment, those kind of things for doing reliable uh, collection of telemetry. And for the past few years, I've been working on telemetry systems for the monitoring and control of distributed uh, IoT assets, uh, mainly for um, distributed renewable energy. Um, now, the telemetry from these systems is typically an unbounded stream. It's just going to go on forever, unbounded stream of measurements. And it's usually these systems are designed such that that eventual consistency is OK, but we do need to be careful to make sure that the messages are always ordered. Um, and these, these systems usually require very reliable data collection and very low latency because they're being used to make operational decisions for the business. So from these constraints and from these requirements, some very common patterns emerge. And that's what I'd like to talk about here today is how the Aka Streams API is really powerful for addressing these common patterns. And it supports building extremely reliable, uh, scalable, and resilient systems. So th this is a very introductory talk. Uh, it's, it's intended to be very introductory. And it's mainly targeted at application developers. So if you're new to Scala or Aka, I hope you find this talk uh, rather accessible. If you're familiar with Aka already, uh, per perhaps you're not familiar with the streaming APIs. I hope you find it valuable. If you're already familiar with everything that I talk about here today, maybe this is the talk for you to share with your colleagues who aren't yet convinced to, to use the Aka Streams API. And the talk's broken into uh, two pieces. So the, f in the, the first part, I want to present a motivating example that really demonstrates the pitfalls of developing these systems for streaming telemetry without actually using explicit streaming APIs. And then the second part, I want to explore these common patterns that come up again and again and show how they can be addressed with the Aka Streams API. And then I'll just briefly conclude by coming back to the motivating example. And just a disclaimer uh, that I have to say before I begin is that uh, this presentation is based on my personal experience and personal opinions. It doesn't necessarily represent um, the, my, any of my employers. OK, to begin, a motivating example. So let's say we have uh, a fleet of wind turbines that we want to collect telemetry from so that we can control them or monitor them. And we want to build a web service that those wind turbines are going to connect to and upload telemetry. And that web service will be responsible for storing that telemetry in a database that can be used by other applications. And I want to build a proof of concept for this system using Aka actors. And I'll start with uh, an actor that's going to maintain uh, the connection to the database. So if you're not familiar with actors, actors are really just a class. And you interface with that class through message passing. It's really fairly simple. And this database actor is going to hold a, the database client so that it can interact with the database. Oops. And whenever it receives a new insert message with a new sample from a wind turbine, it's going to call this insert async method on the client to insert that sample into the database. And for, for now, since this is just a, a prototype proof of concept, I'm going to ignore error handling and return to it later in the presentation. So the database actor can be created as follows. And then it can be used uh, in, in this WebSocket flow. So every wind turbine is going to have a WebSocket connection to our service for uploading telemetry. WebSockets are actually implemented using the Aka Streams API, which I'll return to a little bit later on. But basically, each time we get a new message from one of those wind turbines with some uh, telemetry, we're going to send that message to the database actor. And we can share that database actor across connections. And the database actor will be responsible for uploading the telemetry to the database. So it's pretty simple. So the, the first problem we run into when we start uh, testing this application is that we have really poor performance because we're sending an individual measurement at a time to the database. So we need to have some kind of grouping in order to have efficient writes. So we're uh, smart programmers. So we can extend the, the database actor to buffer a sequence of samples 
in memory and we'll keep track of the count. So each time we get a new sample, we'll just append that to the sequence and increment the count by one. And then once the count reaches 1,000, then we'll insert a batch of telemetry into the database. And this will give us more efficient writes. And the insert method looks as follows. We'll call this bulk uh, insert method. And then we'll set the samples to nil and set the count to zero after a successful write. OK, so this delivers much better performance. We're happy with that. The next problem we run into is that message delivery in these systems can be, can be quite irregular, especially if telemetry is reported on change rather than on some regular interval. And waiting until we have a batch of 1,000 samples uh, sometimes introduces too much latency into the system. We want the data to be available in the database in near real time. So we can solve this problem in the database actor again by introducing a timer, which is easy to do with an actor. And we'll just send ourselves a tick message once a second. And when we receive this tick message, we'll call that insert method in order to insert whatever has been buffered up to this point in memory into the database. And then we'll reset the timer to expire in another second. So we, th this solves the problem in terms of having the telemetry in near real time in the database. It's, it'll be there within roughly one second now. But of course, we worked hard previously to batch our writes at 1,000. And now we could have one of these timers fire right after we've just inserted a complete batch. And of course, this bothers us a little bit, and we can't resist uh, uh, fixing it. It's probably premature optimization, but let's address it anyway. And we can in, in address this by introducing another variable. But of course, this is getting a little hard to read now, so I'll zoom in a bit. So we could introduce a Boolean uh, variable that indicates whether we've written samples to the database in the last interval. Uh, so when we do have a full batch of 1,000, uh, we'll set this flush variable to false. And then when our periodic uh, one second timer expires, if we've already inserted a batch within the last second, we'll just skip uh, the periodic insert and then reset the, the Boolean. OK, another thing we notice when we start testing this proof of concept at scale is that sometimes we can overwhelm the database with writes. And this starts to negatively impact other applications that are using it. So some, somehow we need to throttle these requests against the database uh, and limit the concurrency through some of these dynamics. So we can solve this by introducing yet another uh, mutable variable. Uh, we're going to keep track of the, another, the, the number of outstanding requests. And each time we initiate a new asynchronous request to the database, we'll increment this variable by one. And we'll never let more than 10 outstanding requests to the database occur at any one time. Of course, this also means if we want to maintain our, our batch size of 1,000, now we need to uh, split that sequence and keep track of what's remaining in memory. And it also means that we need to decrement uh, that variable. So when the, when the uh, database insert completes, we're going to send ourselves a message in order to decrement the counter. And when we receive that decrement message, we'll decrement the counter by one. And if there are still more than 1,000 outstanding events in memory, we'll insert those into the database. And of course, we can't remember to set that magic flush variable to false. OK, so how does, how does our proof of concept look? We started out with this very simple uh, database actor. It was easy to get our, our heads around, and it looked fairly promising. And we've ended up with this. And if I zoom in on this insert method, at first glance, it's really not even clear uh, what this is doing. In fact, I'd love if there's a bug in here because it would, it would kind of prove my point. Um, so we've seen that the, the actor is good at managing that mutable state. All that mutable state's in the actor. We didn't have to sprinkle it throughout, of our, throughout our application. And we didn't have to make changes throughout our application. It's all contained within the actor. That was nice. We haven't had to worry about uh, thread safety or locking. Uh, that's all been uh, encapsulated within the actor. And certainly the timers within the actor itself, those were easy to use. But if we take a step back, we're having to deal with all the, the, the same old problems we had to deal with in, in multi-threaded programs in C++, Java, C Sharp, and in dealing with concurrency, we're having to manage memory, we're having to manage flow control. And certainly the testing of this actor is not going to be trivial uh, at all the way it's currently structured. And I haven't even considered error handling yet. I, I kind of ignored that. Um, and that's going to add significant complexity to this actor, especially if we need to maintain order, which is often the case in systems that stream telemetry. 
And of course, we've done a good job to throttle the requests against the database now, but we've done nothing to throttle calls against the service itself. And by default, actor mailboxes are unbounded. So if we have thousands of wind turbines, Yeah, you get the point. So we're going to need to implement some kind of flow control in order to you know, tell the wind turbines to, to slow down that the service itself is overwhelmed. And of course, that's going to add uh, significant complexity to this application. So I'd say that our proof of concept actually looks pretty shattered, uh, as well as I'd say our faith in actors at this point, especially for streaming workloads. So I just want to briefly take a look at uh, reactive streams. So the reactive streams is a, it's a specification um, that's focused on asynchronous stream processing. A lot, lot of um, and and it, and it delivers non-blocking flow control. So a lot of systems uh, implement flow control either through blocking or polling, whereas reactive st streams is focused on doing that in an asynchronous manner that's more efficient. And what it ends up doing is it gives us bounded resource constraints and it makes our applications run really reliably. And it's also focused on interoperability, interoperability of libraries and interoperability of systems. And here's an example, uh, part of the specification for the subscriber. You can see it's a, it's a small interface and this gives a, a sampling of some of the specification here. And here's an example of a um, Reactive Streams open source library that I contributed a little bit to. You can see that we need to worry about things like variables being null in order to make sure that we um, obey the specification. If you are writing your own libraries, make sure you use the TCK out there to make sure that you're compliant in these kind of things. We also need to worry about operations being atomic, right? We're not in an actor here, so we need to make sure that we're performing certain operations atomically, and we also need to worry about threads in some cases. So I think this this is a point that's that's often uh, misunderstood. Uh, people hear about reactive streams or they read the reactive streams uh, specification, they get excited because it's the thing that's going to solve their problems. But it's really intended for library developers. The average application developer shouldn't be programming at this level of abstraction. Um, we want to be using a higher level uh, end user API. And there's a number of those APIs out there. Um, and Aka Streams API is my particular favorite. I really, really love the Aka Streams API. So just briefly looking at Aka Streams API, it has this notion of sources, which are elements that only emit messages. They don't actually have any inputs. And they have syncs, which have um, messages that come in, but they don't have any outputs. And then there's these elements that have messages that come in and go out, and they can perform uh, different transformations like mapping, filtering, throttling, and so on. And they can be composed together into flows in simple cases like maybe an ETL application, or in more complex cases where you need to merge streams or bifurcate streams, uh, they can be arranged into graphs. And of course, because the Aka Streams API obeys the Reactive Streams specification, there's this asynchronous back pressure throughout the pipeline. Uh, and what that means is that the, the upstream basically can't overwhelm the downstream because the upstream doesn't push messages downstream. The downstream requests demand from upstream. Uh, and this can be done asynchronously and it can be batched. So it's actually quite efficient. Okay, part two of the presentation. I want to take a look at um, a bunch of patterns, some of which we've already seen. Uh, that occur all the time when you're dealing with streaming telemetry and look at how the Aka Streams API can be used to address those. And I want to provide tiny little self-contained examples that hopefully are easy to understand, as well as a visual representation for each one. Okay, so the, the first pattern we've already seen, which is, is grouping messages so that we can have efficient writes. And this can be done with the grouped element uh, from the Aka Streams API. And basically what it does is you set a group size and it's gonna batch elements up to the group size and then emit uh, a sequence of elements downstream. And in terms of code, it looks like the following. So here's a source that's gonna tick every 10 milliseconds. And I'm gonna construct a, a random sample with the current time and, and a random value. And then I'm gonna group those in a batch of 1,000 and insert them into the database. 
and run with sync ignore because I'm not interested in, in the results. Now, a problem that we've already seen is that sometimes grouping introduces too much latency in these telemetry systems. Because we're making, when we want to make near real time operational decisions with them, we, we need to um, be sensitive to latency. So the way to do this with Aqua Streams is the grouped within element. And so grouped within can be used by just replacing a grouped with grouped within. And what this is going to do is emit um, elements downstream in either batches of 1,000 or whatever has been buffered uh, within 100 milliseconds, whatever comes first. So the batch sizes downstream won't, won't necessarily be uniform anymore. But you're going you're gonna to reduce, you're going to have a, a kind of maximum bound on the latency. Okay, another common pattern, especially that happens in IoT, is uh, the need for disaggregation. Sometimes you have IoT devices that are offline for a while and they buffer up a bunch of messages and you want to disaggregate those. Or often IoT devices will uh, send aggregate messages with samples from many sensors and you might want to also disaggregate those. So let's revisit the, the wind turbines and let's say it uploads this JSON message which has an ID, a unique ID for the, for the asset. It has a timestamp, and then it has this uh, array of, of measurements, uh, one for the power, one for the rotor speed, and one for the wind speed. And let's say we want to take that JSON message and disaggregate it into a measurement where the ID is the unique ID of the asset, the timestamp is the timestamp, the signal is the name of the measurement, and then the value is the value. We want to construct one of these for the power, and one of these for the rotor speed, and one of these for the wind speed. And there'll be this parse message that'll take in the JSON and emit this sequence of measurements, and I'll leave that up to your imagination. So the way to do this disaggregation with the Aqua Streams API is using Map Concat. And so what Map Concat does, it takes, it takes in an aggregate, has some way of disaggregating it, and then emitting individual elements downstream. What this looks like, uh, here's, here's a source uh, with JSON, and th this is our parse function that's going to emit uh, a sequence of elements, and map concat is going to emit those as individual elements downstream. And then again, we can group them back up in a batch of 1,000 and insert them into the database. Okay, the next pattern I want to look at is filtering. This, again, this often happens, again, in, in IoT applications. You, you want to filter out uh, legacy messages or messages that you're not interested in or messages that are improperly formatted that you can't deserialize or uh, values that are impossible, like a, a battery with a negative state of charge, something like that. Uh, it's, it's often really important to clean up the telemetry on ingest of these applications. So there's, there's a bunch of ways to filter streams with the Aqua Streams API. Uh, the first case is filter. And what filter does is it takes a Boolean function. So here's a, here's a source that's going to emit the integers from 1 to 10. And it's going to filter out the integers that are odd and emit the even integers downstream. So whatever returns true will be passed downstream. Whatever we return false for will be filtered out. And of course, this can be written more succinctly in this case as follows. Another way to filter streams is using collect or collect type. So collect takes a partial function and it'll filter out whatever we don't match on. Uh, so this is the equivalent of the, the filter case that we just looked at. Um, probably a little more realistic example for collect is if you have say a map stage upstream that's mapping the values into valid values for the even integers and invalid values for the um, for the odd integers, and then you can collect the valid ones downstream. And note that you can also you can also transform the element. You can operate on the individual element here, turning it into a string. So in the filter case, it's just a boolean, and it passes the original element downstream. In the collect, you, you're allowed to operate on the element. If all you want to do is just uh, filter based on type, you can use collect type. So whatever you match on will be passed downstream, and whatever doesn't match will be filtered out. Now, filtering in these, uh, in these telemetry systems, it often feels like the right thing to do, but when you start running production systems, uh, 
usually you find out that you don't actually want to filter things out. You want to inspect those in some way. You want to increment counters. You want to log them because you want to answer questions like, why is this device sending me a message that I can't deserialize? And so that you can address that. So one way to do this is with divert to. And what divert to will allow you to do is send certain messages to a sync and pass the rest of the message down, uh, me rest of the messages downstream. So as an example, here's a logging sync that's going to log all of the invalid messages so that we could inspect those later and maybe take some action. And then we'll use it with an either monad. So the left side will be valid uh, measurements and the right side will be invalid measurements. And then we're going to divert all of the invalid uh, messages to that error sync so that we can log them. And then we'll pass all of the valid ones downstream so that we can operate on them independently. And just one more thing worth mentioning with, with all of these patterns that involve filtering, um, a lot of these telemetry systems will have often have some kind of durable queue as part of the pipeline, something like Apache Kafka. Um, and of course, when you're reading off these durable queues, you need to commit offsets. And what this what ends up happening is you, uh, even though you want to filter out messages in your pipeline, often you need to send every message all the way downstream so that you can commit your offsets. And these filtering patterns um, actually are become a little bit of an anti-pattern, I think, when you're reading off of a durable queue. Okay, another pattern that we've already seen is uh, limiting requests against a, uh, another service or a database. So it, it, here's the example we've been looking at where we're, um, we have a synchronous call to the database to insert the telemetry. If I replace that with an asynchronous request, um, this is a, a mistake a lot of people that are new to Aka Streams API make. It's, it's, even, it's even a mistake that I still make from time to time because this will compile and it'll run. And essentially what you're doing here is you're passing downstream futures, but the futures haven't necessarily been completed yet. So essentially what you've done is eliminated the back pressure. This, this stream, this element is just going to emit futures as fast as the downstream will accept them. So what you really want when you're dealing with asynchronous methods is to use map async. And then map async also has a parallelism factor, which allows you to control how many outstanding uh, requests are being made at any one time. And this is as simple as taking the map stage and just replacing it with map async. And when what map async is going to do, it's going to unwrap, the, it's going to wait for the futures to complete and unwrap the value that's inside and pass that downstream. So you don't have to do any of that yourself. And then in terms of controlling the parallelism, it's as simple as just uh, changing the parallelism factor. So if we want to go from two to four, we just change that number. It's very easy to experiment with the amount of parallelism in the system. Another important thing to note about map async is that it's going to emit the elements downstream in order, no matter which order the futures complete in. Um, and this is often in systems that stream telemetry um, very important or event source systems you want to maintain the order all the way downstream um, if, if you don't care about order you can change the use map async unordered in some cases and what this will do is it will emit those the values from those futures downstream um, as fast as they commit or as fast as they complete basically so if you have a, a kind of head of line blocking um, and and you can tolerate the messages being out of order, uh, map async unordered can sometimes deliver better performance. And it's as simple as replacing the map async with map async unordered. Okay, the next pattern is throttling. Um, so this is a, a pattern where you have a, a fast upstream and a, a slower downstream that's usually defined by um, some kind of like service limits or SLA, something like that where you can only have so many requests per second. And this can be done with the throttle element. So fast upstream, and you want to emit at some kind of defined rate downstream. So here's the example that we've been looking at uh, a few times. Uh, this is going to tick every 10 seconds, or every 10 milliseconds, and generate a random sample. And then I'm going to throttle it such that I'm only emitting one element downstream per second. So even though the upstream is ticking uh, at every 10 milliseconds, only one message per second are, is going to be emitted downstream. 
And there's a few different throttle modes. Uh, here I'm using shaping, which will back pressure to the upstream. Um, there's also a mode where you can fail the stream if you exceed the throttle. Uh, most often when you're streaming telemetry though, you don't want to uh, fail the stream. You just want to uh, push back and back pressure. Another thing to note about throttle is that the if you're dealing with messages that are, are non-uniform, you don't necessarily have to evenly space those messages with the throttle. Um, you can also burst them. So here's an example of, of using the burst. So what this is going to do is allow three messages a second downstream. But if all three of those messages come right away, it'll just emit all of them downstream. And this will give you lower latency. So it'll still respect the total for the period of time, um, but it'll, it'll have lower latency and then it'll let messages downstream right away. Okay, the next pattern is concurrency. Uh, there's actually four planes in this picture. There's another one in the background on the left. I keep, this is the first picture I picked when I was thinking of concurrency. I, I wanted to find like a guy juggling knives or something like that. Um, but since I picked this picture, there's been two or three near miss accidents on this runway, um, which proves that concurrency is still hard. This is in, this is in San Francisco. Um, so understanding that concurrency is hard, um, by default, most uh, AUKUS streams, uh, they, they, they run on top of actors. When you're just using the AUKUS streams API, you, you, you don't really need to know that there's actors there. It's just kind of transparent to you. Um, one of the cases where you do need to understand this is when you, when you want to introduce concurrency. So by default, actors use what's called operator fusing, and it, the uh, stream will run on top of one actor. And this is often the most efficient way to execute the stream. Uh, but there are some workloads where you want the stream to run in parallel. And the way to do this is using uh, async. And what it's going to do is insert an asynchronous boundary. And now that stream will run on two actors, uh, potentially in parallel. And it's going to use message passing in order to communicate between those two actors. So here's an example of using async. Uh, in this case, we're going to uh, gzip, uh, encode a, a JSON string a million times, and then gzip decode that string, same string, a million times. And this will actually execute twice as fast, assuming you have enough cores, uh, with the async in between, because the two map stages can execute in parallel. And it's also worth noting how easy it is to experiment with this parallelism here. We didn't need to introduce threads. We didn't need to introduce reader writer locks or anything like that. All we needed to do was say async, run our benchmarks again, or run our profiling again, and understand if that delivered better performance. And I, I just want to make it clear, because I already talked about map async and, and futures, that uh, this actually doesn't introduce a asynchronous boundary. So certainly those futures might execute on a different thread and they might in, uh, execute in parallel, but there's still one actor that's managing the stream. And there are some cases uh, where it's advantageous to um, still use an asynchronous boundary, even though your stream is using map async to execute futures. And again, this just comes down to benchmarking and profiling and your individual workload. Okay, the next pattern is idle timeouts. So the way, uh, the way to do this is with the idle timeout flow stage. And the way it works is it, you set a timeout. And if no elements have been passed through that stage within the timeout, uh, the, the idle timeout element will throw an exception and fail the stream. So where this is useful is in reclaiming resources. Uh, so imagine those, those wind turbines we were talking about earlier, if they have a WebSocket connection to our service and that WebSocket connection goes idle, we eventually want to reclaim those resources and idle timeout is one way to do that. The other place I found idle timeout really useful in systems that st uh, stream telemetry is in testing those systems. Uh, often en end up using Aka streams to, as kind of like a test probe uh, throughout the system and maybe reading off something like Kafka or a PubSub system and expecting messages within a certain time frame. And if you don't receive those messages within that time frame, idle timeout's a great way to have um, to assert certain behaviors and fail the stream. So here's an example of using idle timeout. This, is a, this source is only going to tick uh, every 10 minutes and generate a random sample. 
And then the idle timeout is set at a minute. So source is ticking at 10 minutes, idle timeout's at one minute, so the stream's gonna fail. And it's gonna fail with this timeout exception and say this was you know, one of those wind turbines, we could actually uh, log a message saying device with certain ID has been idle for a certain amount of time. Okay, this is another pattern that we've already seen is in the motivating example is, is the need for some kind of periodic event. So this might be something like a heartbeat message, a status message, a ping. And the way to do this with the Aka Streams API is to, to generate a source or a source shape that emits those periodic messages and then you merge them with the rest of the stream. So here's an example of a source that's gonna emit a status message once a minute. And then the stream is gonna generate these random samples again once a second, and then we're just gonna merge that with the status message. So it's pretty easy to use. Okay, finally, the last pattern I wanna look at is watching termination. Uh, in case you don't understand the picture, this is a bridge in San Francisco. The bridge on the right is being destroyed over the course of a couple of years, and the bridge on the left is being built over the course of a couple of years. So what watch termination does is it doesn't impact the stream at all. It just observes the stream and allows messages uh, to flow through it. And when the stream completes, you get a future um, that either completes successfully or with a failure and you can take some kind of action. So you basically just get this notification that the stream is completed, um, but you don't impact it in any other way. And here's an example of using it. This is the greeter WebSocket. This is right out of the Aka HTTP documentation and it basically responds to whatever message you send it with hello and your message and it can be used uh, in an HTTP server as follows so if we want to um, say write a message when this uh, greeter WebSocket completes we can watch for termination of that stream and when it completes we'll either know whether it completed successfully or whether it had an exception and we can log a message Okay, so these are all the patterns that I wanted to look at. Um, and in light of these patterns, let's return to the proof of concept that I was constructing earlier. And if you recall, the proof of concept was uh, a service that would collect telemetry from thousands of wind turbines and, and store them in this database. And we took an actor model approach uh, originally with this, um, when we would get a telemetry message from the wind turbine, we would send it to this actor that was responsible for storing the telemetry in the database. And the actor we ended up with looked like this and was performing grouping and throttling and periodic events and so on. So in light of the Aka Streams API, we can actually replace everything that that database actor was doing with these two lines of code. A grouped within, that's gonna group messages into a batch of a thousand, but it's also not gonna wait any longer than a second. So we'll have low latency um, to the database and it's not gonna allow any more than 10 asynchronous requests to the database at any one time so that we don't overwhelm the database. So we replace all this code in the actor with these two lines. And you also note that we got rid of all this mutable state that we had before that we were managing. And also note that this has flow control, which we didn't have before. Because the Aka Streams has back pressure and uses the reactive stream specification, um, this is fully flow controlled and we have bounded resource constraints. Um, now it's beyond the scope of this presentation here, um, but this also has much easier error handling semantics than we would have had in the actor uh, previously. And note that we didn't need to rewrite a whole lot of code. Basically all I did was delete code. Um, and we basically took the business logic that we had previously and we just put it in a streaming context. In terms of testing, I don't feel I need to test grouped within or map async. I trust that the Aka team has done that for me. Um, and generally, all I need to do is test my business logic here, like, like, the, like the parsing function, which of course is easy to unit test. That said, the Aka Streams API also has a, a really good test kit. Uh, where you can basically create a source that creates a, a known sequence of messages and then you can assert that the stream uh, passes through what you would expect. And you can be basically test all of your edge cases in your stream uh, in, in a unit test. Okay, summing up. 
the Aukus Streams API incorporates these, these high-level streaming constructs. So it kind of takes reactive stream specification and, and puts it up in a, in a higher level for application developers. And note that these, these things are really conceptually easy, right? Like something like throttling, it's conceptually easy, but we've seen when you, the devil's kind of in the details when you get into the implementation. Uh, Aukus Streams API, because of the reactive stream specification, also has flow control, and that gives us bounded resource constraints, which makes our applications run really reliably. It's also strongly typed, so we have compile time safety. And it's, it really delivers great performance and reliability. From personal experience, uh, I've worked on many, many of these systems that run in production, and they, they just run, they just work. Um, very responsive to system dynamics and very resilient um, to failures. So what about actors? Um, I think this is, I've seen a few people kind of have this realization at this point is like, well, you know, we thought actors were a great thing. Uh, these streams look way better. Do we even need actors anymore? Um, and the answer is, is yes. Um, so if you're, if you're kind of having that same realization, I'd encourage you to watch this talk that I gave at Reactive Summit last year, which is really the, the complement to this talk. Um, Actors are still really valuable um, for managing the life cycle of a stream or distributing streaming workloads within an ACA cluster. If you're, say your streaming workload uh, you know, is, is too big for one machine and you need to distribute it in a cluster or you want to have it in a cluster for high availability, um, actors are, are really valuable for doing that. And actors are still uh, valuable for maintaining state and I also think they're really valuable for, mo especially in IoT workloads, they're really valuable for, for modeling. So you can model your IoT assets with kind of a digital twin that is the actor. So if you're interested in, in more of that, I would encourage you to, to watch this talk. Uh, that's me on Twitter, if you're into Twitter. Um, that's my blog. Uh, if, if you're interested in what I talked about here today, in written form, along with a, a few more examples, I uh, encourage you to reference these two blog articles. Um, there's also some other things on my blog in terms of Scala, Akka, uh, working in teams, these kind of things. I try and write one article a month, so if you're interested, you can check that out. And we, I believe we have some time for, uh, for questions. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. I'll just start right away. Hi. Hi. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering um, what your recommendation is for using streams. Are you just using a stream in a, uh, have an application which consists of just a single stream? Or if you have an application that contains multiple streams, how to prevent that you know, the, the the rest of the application still performs while the stream is uh, also doing its stuff. You know, not to, if, if there are a lot of events coming in, how to yeah, have the system also do some back pressure on the stream itself <laughs> so that right. it can also do other stuff. Right. Um, I th there's a lot of answers to that question. Uh, <laughs> So it, part of it depends on whether you're using streams for, say, unbounded workflows that are constantly busy, or if you're using streams for um, like short, they're short-lived streams. Like, there's no reason why you can't take a stream, uh, streaming approach to database requests. Um, in fact, I, I think people don't uh, imagine enough where they can use streams that often you can in, uh, like reinvent most of your workloads in a streaming fashion and have that back pressure and have these high level streaming constructs uh, at your fingertips. So if you're doing something like making a request, you have a bunch of short requests against a database and you can compose those in a streaming way. Um, it's, it's not that much different, I'd say, than, than writing normal application code. When you have these uh, streaming workloads that are running all the time. At, you know, so say you're cons you know, it's your ingestion pipeline and you're consuming a, a Kafka partition, something like that. And you know you're going to get 10,000 messages per second and you're going to consume this much CPU all the time. I think th that that's the case where you need to partition your streams relative to your underlying compute resources and be sensitive to you know not packing too many streams uh, in, into one application. Um, 
and there's different ways to do that. Actually, if you, if you, if you check out my, my blog th- this month, and I'm going to write a follow-up article next month, I talk a little bit about how to partition uh, Aka streams in cases where you are starting to, to, to use too much compute on, on one machine. More questions? Hi. Uh, amazing presentation, by the way. Uh, I just okay. wanted to ask, uh, in the demo you showed uh, saving data in the map and then map async. Uh, is there a reason why this couldn't be uh, expressed in the sync uh, fashion to, to saving that? Because it seems uh, naively as the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I, could you comment that on yeah, that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, in some cases, it is, is, it is the right thing to do. And that's a pattern that that I have used. Um, I I think more often than not, though, you want to inspect the result of what happened uh, in the database and maybe pass that to a logging stage or something like that. And very often in these t- t- telemetry systems, you want to uh, send back an acknowledgement to the device to say, "Hey, I I got your message. You don't need to retry." Or you want to uh, commit the offsets to Kafka or something like that. So the, you often you kind of think of the database as being your sync and the end of the stream, but it's not actually it, it's not usually the case. I'd say you, usually you want to still have some more downstream processing, commit offsets, have acknowledgments, and so on. And that's that's actually a more common pattern to to say write to a database in a in a map async stage and then have more elements downstream. Uh, hi, um, you mentioned about watch termination of a stream, but uh, how can I, for example, if I want to shut down the stream based on an external factor, uh, I receive a message from somewhere else, but I still have the guarantee that all the message uh, messages that are incoming in the stream are going to be processed, but it's still being able to shut down safely the stream based yeah. on something outside the source. Yeah, there, there's there's ways to do that. Uh, watch watch the the other presentation I referenced from Reactive Summit. I, I talk about some of those details and how to interact in that way. Um, yeah, regarding the the map async thing, it it won't handle back pressure, right? Map the 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 stream will yes. Okay, but not not the database because it's not a it's not part of the the source. It won't request like when it's ready to for more data because you like bulk insert into it. So you, it looks like you kind of try to manage what the database can accept. Uh, yeah, but yeah. is it possible to improve that and like put a, a database driver part of of the the reactive stream so you don't have to handle like. Yeah, like bulking or, or stuff like that. It yeah, if that your database can actually have a reactive streams interface, then absolutely. Yeah, then like if you look at say how a WebSocket interacts at the TCP layer, right? That is like back pressured the whole way through. Um, if your database has has a driver that can understand that, then yeah, you you don't need to do something as as crude as map async. But um, and, like, what you what you'll find is. Often you're, you know, you're making say HTTP calls against another service, these kind of things, and often you're ma- you're map using map async in those cases. But, um, but yeah, absolutely, it 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 doesn't preclude um, a service with a with a proper Reactive Streams interface. 